Good evening and welcome. Tonight we're going to be continuing our read through of this awesome book, Battles Map by Map. And tonight we're going to look at the battles between the Greeks and the Persians. Just a little background. The Greeks at this time were composed of, well, I should say Greece at this time was composed by city-states. So it wasn't one unified country or kingdom or empire or any of that. They were separate city-states, with the two dominant ones being Athens and Sparta. Meanwhile, the other end of the Mediterranean was the Achaemenid Persian Empire, which at the time was the largest, most powerful empire in the world. So what happens when the Persian Empire started expanding into Greece. First, we're going to find out at the Battle of Marathon, part one of three of the major battles, Greece versus Persia. So let's see. In 490 BCE, an army sent by Persian Emperor Darius I invaded mainland Greece, going ashore at Marathon. Despite being heavily outnumbered, the soldiers of the Greek city-state of Athens and its allies from Plataea boldly engaged the Persian invasion force. In the early 5th century BCE, the expanding Persian Achaemenid Empire controlled a vast area from northern India to southeast Europe and including among its subjects Ionian Greeks in western Anatolia in what is today Western Turkey. The Greek city-states of Athens and Eritrea supported an Ionian revolt against Persian rule that was crushed by a Darius I in 494 BCE. It was Darius's resolve to punish the Athenians and Eritreans that motivated the Persian invasion of Greece in 490 BCE. When the seaborne Persian army landed at Marathon, the Athenians marched out under leaders including Miltiades, I'm not sure, to confront the invaders at their landing ground. The Spartans, the most militaristic of the Greeks, were urged to join the war, but insisted they could not come out immediately because they were engaged in sacred ceremonies. Only the small city of Plataea, at the last moment, sent troops to aid Athens. The battle is known chiefly through the account of the Greek historian Herodotus, in which many details are obscure and some mythologized. News of the Greek victory is said to have been carried to Athens by the messenger Phidippides who ran 26 miles, or 42 kilometers, given, giving the name to the modern Marathon. A setback rather than a disaster for the Persians, the defeat delayed a full-scale invasion of Greece for another 10 years. Let's look a little at the background, if I can carefully slide this over for you to look at. Persian campaign. It says here the Persians set out to invade Greece in 492 BCE, but this expedition was abandoned after a storm destroyed their fleet. So the first invasion in 492 is the red arrows here. They're sailing out through here, past Troy, and then as they were coming around past Thrace up here. Storm ended their campaign early. In 490 BCE, a second attempt was made under Datis and Artaphernes. The Persians sailed by a southerly route toward Eritrea and Athens. Eritrea was swiftly destroyed. The Persian army then re-embarked and landed at Marathon, 26 miles northeast of Athens. So here they come, heading up this way, and it says here they're stopping at Naxos, the 
Persians seize and destroy Naxos on their way to attack Eritrea and Athens. They head up to Eritrea, attack it, and then they're on their way to fight Athens. Here at Marathon is where the battle is. A little background. Marathon was not a large battle fought in a single day. It involved some 10,000 Greeks fighting 25,000 Persian troops. The victorious Greeks were hoplites, armored foot soldiers who fought at close quarters in a tight formation called a phalanx. Their tactics surprised the Persians, who preferred to fight at a distance with bows and javelins. The battle made the reputation of the Greek hoplites as fearsome infantry. So the Greeks will be in blue, the Persians will be in purple. Let's set the stage for the battle. Part one. The Greeks attack. The Athenians and their allies took up a position blocking the Persians on the coastal plain. After a standoff for several days, Miltiades decided to attack. His troops, all hoplites armed with spears and shields, ran in tight formation toward the Persian army. A diverse force including javelin throwers, archers, and horsemen. So here come the Greeks. And it says right here that the Greek formation in the center is only four men deep. Hey, rooster. We four men deep. Or as you can see here, there are um, eight men deep on the flanks. But it's the center that's attacking first. Rooster's been so loud tonight. It's raining outside. I think that's irritating the rooster. But anyway, back to Marathon. Charge and counter charge. The hoplites in the center of the Greek line became disorganized, stumbling over rough ground under a rain of arrows. Seeing their enemy falter, the Persian infantry launched a countercharge. Struggling to reform their phalanx formations, the Greek hoplites retreated. Here come the Persians to attack. as the Saka tribal vassals of the Persians armed with axes led the counter charge in the center. How terrifying to see a bunch of men with axes running at you. So then the Greeks got disorganized and retreated. Trying to come back here to reorganize their formation. Greek advance on the flanks. Remember, here's the flanks. Here they come. The Persians pushed the hoplites back in the center. On the flanks, however, the dense masses of armored Greek infantry charged the inferior Persian foot soldiers who had been relegated to the wings. Overwhelmed, the Persian infantry on the flanks fled the field. So here comes the flanks over here. Pew, 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 to fight. Pew, 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 to fight. And it sounds like they put their strongest people in the middle. So the other sides are like, oh no, we didn't expect this, and they're fleeing. Here's their command center. And look, here's all the Persian ships here. It says the fleet of boats that brought the Persian army to Greece is beached on the shore. So they're running this way, going up, up, up. Let's see what happens now. Envelopment. The Athenian and Plataean hoplites on the wings resisted pursuing the routed Persian infantry, instead turning inward and attacking the exposed flanks of the Persian troops who had advanced against the Greek center. Threatened with envelopment, the Persians found themselves engaged in a close quarter struggle for survival. So let's see. Now it looks like all of the hoplites are surrounding them, and the Athenians and the Plataeans are coming in to fight. 
It says here, trapped by envelopment, thousands of Persians are killed by Greek hoplite spears in face-to-face -face combat. Pew, 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 pew. So they're getting enveloped by the hoplites. So what do the Persians do? The Persians fled back toward their ships, which rapidly began to put to sea. There was fierce fighting on the beach with the pursuing Greeks, who seized seven Persian vessels. After the battle, the Greeks counted 6,400 Persian bodies left on the field. Greek sources claim that their own losses totaled no more than 200. So let's see, the Persians are retreating. chasing him. Then they're going to fight on the beach here. It also says that Callimachus, the Athenian war archon, is killed in hand-to-hand -hand fighting on the beach. So the Greeks took all these ships right here, and then the Persians are running onto their boats and they're taken out, saying goodbye, no thank you. And that's the Battle of Marathon. Part two, the Empire Strikes Back at Thermopylae. And if you know the movie 300, that's this battle. Thermopylae says, celebrated for acts of heroism and self-sacrifice, Thermopylae was a delaying action fought in Greece by a small body of Spartan-led Greek hoplites against a vast invading army of the Persian Empire. The Spartans held a mountain pass for three days against superior forces before being betrayed and overwhelmed. In 480 BCE, the Persian Empire resumed its bid to conquer Greece having temporarily abandoned its attempt ten years earlier, after the defeat of Darius I at the Battle of Marathon. Xerxes I, his son and successor, led an army from Asia into Europe across the Hellespont, which today is known as the Dardanelles Strait, on a bridge of boats, and advanced down the Greek coast accompanied by a large offshore fleet. The Greek city-states, usually divided, agreed to cooperate in the face of this common threat. The city of Sparta sent 300 hoplites northward under King Leonidas to block the Persian advance, and other city-states sent contingents to join the Spartans. An army of about 7,000 Greeks took a position in the Thermopylae Pass, a narrow stretch of land between Mount Calandromu and the sea on the east coast of central Greece. The Persian army they faced was huge. Exact figures are unknown, but it is thought the army numbered more than 100,000 men. Whether the fighting at Thermopylae significantly delayed the progress of the Persian invasion is open for debate. After the conflict, the Persian army occupied Athens and was overcome only when the naval defeat at Salamis forced some of it to withdraw, with the remainder defeated at Plataea the following year. However, Thermopylae has a legendary status in Greece, as well as in wider European culture, where it became a symbol of supposed European moral superiority. There's a quote here from Leonidas saying, eat your breakfast as if you were to eat your dinner in the other world, which is the fancy version of the tonight we dine in hell quote. Let's see. You know, let's read about hoplites first. Spartan hoplites. In ancient Greece, Sparta was the only city-state with full-time soldiers. Male Spartan citizens dedicated their lives to training for war, 
following an austere regime of exercise and military drills, while civilian work was carried out by slaves. Other Greeks, whose soldiers were part-time militia, were in awe of the abilities of the Spartan warriors. Their hardiness and discipline, as demonstrated at Thermopylae, made Sparta the dominant Greek city-state in land warfare as Athens was at sea. Alright, let's check out the battle. Let's see what happened. There it is. Here's the mountain. And, oh, let's check out this first. Holding the pass. It says, using local knowledge, the Greeks fought where Mount Calidromo descends to the Gulf of Malia. The shoreline then was much closer to the mountains than it is today. So here we go. Preparing for battle. This is in 480 BCE, August to early September. It says here, knowing they would be heavily outnumbered by the Persians, the Greeks took up position at the narrowest point in the Thermopylae Pass, the Middle Gate where only a limited number of soldiers from either side would be able to engage at any one time. Nonetheless, when they saw the Persian army arrive, many of the Greek commanders argued for withdrawal. I forgot to mention the Greeks are blue, Persians are red this time. So here's the Spartans and their allies here at the middle gate. And here's a wall it's going to talk about in a second that they rebuilt. Opening clashes, September 8th. After a four-day delay, Xerxes launched his army in a frontal attack. Thousands of archers delivered an opening barrage, which had little impact on the armor top lines. Then Xerxes' infantry, the Medes and Scythians, swarmed forward, but were slaughtered by the Greeks, drawn up in phalanx formation in front of the Phocian wall. Reluctantly, Xerxes resolved to commit the immortals, his crack troops, to the battle in the pass. So it says here, the Greeks repaired the Phocian wall, and we're all in it to decay. There's Xerxes himself, commanding from a chariot in the rear, and first you can see the archers there firing here. Are very heavily armored and they have shields, so far away arrows don't really do much. They just block them. So here comes the Persians do, 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 to fight. There's the Spartans going around the wall to fight, fight, fight. And they go back when they win. More Persians come, fight, fight, fight. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. And it says here that the frontal attacks by Persian troops failed to break through the Greek forces holding the pass. What happens next? Fighting to a standstill, it says. The 10,000 Persian immortals attacked in waves. Leonidas rotated his troops, successfully placing contingents from different cities in the front line. At moments, he staged fake retreats, drawing the Persians forward so the Greeks could punish them with counterattacks. Xerxes assumed that he must be wearing down Greek resistance, but renewed Persian attacks the following day were again repulsed with heavy losses. Don't underestimate the Spartans. So what is Xerxes going to do? The Greeks are betrayed September 9th and 10th. The betrayal of the Greeks by a local man called Ephialtes gave Xerxes new hope. Ephialtes offered to guide the Persians along a goat path through the mountains leading to the rear of the Greek position. The Spartan king Leonidas had positioned 1,000 Phocian troops to defend it, faced with 20,000 Persian infantry, however the Phocians decided not to engage and later withdrew. So let's check out this goat path. Here it says the Persian column led by Hydarnes. Hydarnes sets out at nightfall to outflank the Greeks. Here they come. It's 
says, file these guides the Persian call on the long ago to path to the higher mountain pass. Here they come. The Persian call marches along the goat path to encircle the creeks. There's the Phocians. The Phocian troops sent by Leonidas are positioned to block path, but they see all these persons coming and they go. The outnumbered Phocian hoplites withdraw to the nearby hill and are bypassed. So here we come. The Persians. The Persian outflanking column advances. Informed of the Persian outflanking move, Leonidas knew the battle was lost. Ordering most of his army to withdraw, he remained at the pass with his 300 Spartans, supported by 700 Thespians and 400 Thebans, to cover the retreat. At dawn, he led his men out to meet the Persians on open ground. As Xerxes sent forward his cavalry and light infantry, Leonidas was killed by an arrow. So here you can see the Greeks retreating because they know the battle's over. They're going, leaving the battle. It says most of the Greek forces sent away before the last stand. So get out of here while you can. And let's see the last. Oh, Persian attack. The surviving Spartans and Thespians carried Leonidas' body to a hill behind the Phocian Wall, where they fought to the death against the Persians. Only the Thebans surrendered. When the fighting was over, Xerxes had Leonidas' corpse decapitated and crucified as revenge for the losses he had inflicted. The Phocian Wall was dismantled, and the Persian army continued their advance. So here they carry Leonidas up here, doo -doo -doo, up to the hill here. It says the surviving Greek hoplites fight to the last man surrounded on a small hill. And that was the Battle of Thermopylae. If you haven't seen the movie 300, it's a really good representation of this battle. Lots of action. <laughs> and let's head on to part three of Greece versus Persia, Salamis. The huge naval battle fought off the island of Salamis in 480 BCE is considered a turning point in world history. A decisive victory for the city-states of Greece over the invading forces of the Persian ruler Xerxes I, it secured the survival of ancient Greek civilization. The Greek victory at Marathon in 490 BCE had been a dire insult to the Persian Empire. Ten years later, the Persian ruler Xerxes led a second invasion of Greece, this time commanding much larger land and sea forces. The Persians were able to assemble a powerful navy from their subject peoples around the Mediterranean including the Phoenicians, the Egyptians, and the Ionian Greeks, all good sailors, especially the Phoenicians. Anticipating an attack, the Greek city-states had made plans for a joint defense, but relations between them were combative, and unity was precarious. In 482 BCE, Athens, inspired by the leadership of Themistocles, embarked on a major shipbuilding program that made the city the leading Greek power at sea. Xerxes' power on land proved irresistible when he launched his invasion in 480 BCE, 
but the battle at Salamis demonstrated the clear superiority of the Athenians and their allies at sea. After the battle, Xerxes withdrew from Greece with part of his army, leaving a reduced force under Mardonius to complete the Persian conquest. However, he was defeated the following year, and the attempt to rule Greece was abandoned. The following century was the golden age of Greek civilization, centered on Athens, with high achievements in philosophy, the arts, and political thought. So let's see this map. Let's see what's going on in grander scale during this invasion. The Persian path. Advancing to Athens, the Persian army overcame Greek resistance at Thermopylae, and the Persian fleet tried, but failed, to destroy the Greek fleet at Artemisium. Evacuating Athens, the Athenian population took refuge with the Greek fleet on Salamis. So the Persian army's the purple arrow here. So they're heading up. They reach the Dardanelles here, right? Or the Hellespont. So the Persians build a bridge of boats across the Hellespont, allowing their army to march from Asia into Europe. Around here, following the water, coming around, around, around. Meanwhile, the Persian fleet is sailing out this way. They hit Mount Athos. What does Xerxes do? The Persian fleet sails through a canal cut by Xerxes at the base of Mount Athos. They sail around, following the land over here. And oh, look what happened here! Hundreds of ships. Persian invasion fleet are lost in a storm off the coast of Thessaly at Cape Sapius. Oops. So now they're sailing in here. And meanwhile, it looks like the foot soldiers uh, fought at Artemisium. Oh, I think the naval battle was Artemisium, right? Yes. Because they, they kind of lost. But this was Thermopylae, which the foot soldiers had better success in. So now the fleet is heading down toward Athens, down here, and the soldiers are marching toward Athens. And since everyone fled to the island of Salamis, that's where they're heading. That sets the stage. Always forget this box. Can you see there? The naval showdown at Salamis. The oared galleys of the Greek and Persian fleets clashed in a narrow channel. The Persians were outmaneuvered and outfought by an enemy with superior morale. So in this one, the Greeks are red, Persians are green. I wish they kept the colors more consistent, but oh well. Alright, now let's look at the battle map. Starting with the night before the battle. The Mystocles persuaded the Athenians as allies that the Persians could be defeated in the waters off Salamis. He fed the Persians false information, making them believe the Greek warships intended to slip away. Xerxes ordered his fleet to block their escape, keeping two squadrons to the east of Salamis through the night. It is believed he may have also sent a crack Egyptian squadron around the island to the west to block a possible escape route, but this is disputed. So here is the Persian fleet. Because they're looking out for Greek ships trying to escape. And Xerxes, who meanwhile is actually up here, he's up on this mountain. It says he's watching the action from a vantage point on Mount Egalia. Overlooking the strait, the exact location is disputed. But Xerxes sends some ships up here. There they go. And they come up here because here's the island, right? So they're blocking them from coming out this way. However, the Persian sailors are exhausted after. 
after their night patrol. They've been up all night waiting for the Greeks to escape and they're tired. So what happens next? The Persians enter the streets. Well rested after a sound night's sleep, the Greeks in Ambalaki and Pelukia bays launched their boats at dawn. Two squadrons of the Persian fleet their sailors, exhausted after their night patrol, entered the Salamis Channel. Salamis Channel. They heard the Greeks singing their hymns well before they saw their warships emerge from behind a headland. Still assuming that the Greeks intended to withdraw, the Persians hastened forward in pursuit of what they thought was a frightened and fleeing enemy. So here come two ships. remember they're sleepy and these guys had a great night's sleep apparently the battle is joined just as Themistocles intended the Salamis channel soon became overcrowded with ships some 600 from the Persian fleet oh my, and 370 Greek vessels the Athenians and Corinthians entered the channel on the left of the Greek line while the Spartans and other Greek contingents were on the right. Although the Persian ships were more numerous than the Greek vessels, the confines of the Salamis Channel favored the heavier Greek triremes. So there's the Corinthians and Athenians, and here's the Spartans and their other allies, and here come their ships. Going this way, it says, because the Corinthians veer northwards, giving the Persians the impression they were fleeing from battle. But surprise! And the Spartans going. Doo -doo 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 -doo. The right wing remained close to the shore. So here they come, full of ships now, crowding this very narrow channel with so many different ships. The Greeks gained the upper hand read the deal. Moving across to the mainland side of the Salamis Channel, the Athenians and Corinthians turned to meet the advancing Persian warships and engaged them with ramming and boarding. The Spartans and their allies on the Greek right ran broadside into the Persian fleet, passing the mouth of Ambalaki Bay. The battle disintegrated into a vast melee, which favored the highly motivated Greek forces. So here's on this side. Do, 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 with the attack, attack. Do, 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 attack, attack. And here it says that Persian naval commander and Xerxes' brother, Ariobignes, I believe, is killed fighting the Athenians on the Persian right. Aria, big knees. Big knees. I don't know. Anyway. The Persians are defeated. As Persian resistance in the channel crumbled, the Athenians attacked the main Persian fleet, parts of which hoisted and fled for the open sea. The Greeks landed a force on Cytalia, Cytalia Island and massacred the Persian soldiers there. Xerxes, furious with his navy, executed two of his Phoenician captains, and soon after his defeat withdrew his army or northward. So the Persians are running away. Pew, pew, pew. They're saying, let's go to this side. Greeks versus Persians. Greeks win. Best two out of three. Let's
let's read a little bit more about the ancient Greeks at war. Let me get this nice and centered for you. It's about as good as I can get. There. The Greek city-states of the classical era developed a unique style of fighting, both on land and at sea. Their citizen soldiers were widely regarded to be the finest infantry of their day, excelling in close quarter combat. Greek armies in the 5th and 4th centuries BCE centered around heavily armored foot soldiers known as hoplites. Wearing a bronze helmet, a... what is this word? Queerus? Queer? Queer? to protect the upper body, and greaves to protect the legs. Hoplites carried a large shield and used a spear as their primary weapon. Hoplites fought shoulder to shoulder in a phalanx, a tight formation usually eight ranks deep, with each man's shield covering the exposed side of his neighbor to the left. Often at war with one another, Greek city-states differed in military organization. In Sparta, all men underwent rigorous training from an early age, resulting in a hardened, disciplined infantry. In democratic Athens, however, military service was a part-time duty of free male citizens, and hoplites received very little formal training. Athenian citizens were expected to provide their own equipment, and those too poor to afford it volunteered to serve as oarsmen in the fleet instead. Slaves were used as light infantry skirmishers, that's a good word, skirmisher, supported by professional archers, slingers, and javelin men, another cruel cool word, javelin men. All Greek can you see? There we go, sorry. All Greek citizen soldiers were highly motivated by attachment to their home city. When Greek cities fought one another, as in the Peloponnesian Wars, phalanx clashed with phalanx, shield to shield, in murderous close quarter battles. The quality of Greek foot soldiers was widely appreciated and they were recruited as mercenaries by other countries, including Persia. So you can see here on um, what kind of looks like a vase or a bowl, something round. You can tell from the bottom. We can see the hoplites with their big shields. And their spears. This is that you can see the different designs on all their shields because remember they owned their own weapons so so I bet they decorated it themselves or they all represent something about their families or something I think that's pretty cool but let's read about one other aspect of battling by the Greeks and that is the Athenian trireme the Athenian trireme, shown here in a later illustration, obviously there's no photographs or anything at that time, was a swift, nimble warship rowed by about 170 oarsmen in three tiers. It carried a handful of fighting men and mainly depended on the bronze-sheathed ram at its prow to sink enemy vessels by driving holes in them below the waterline. Very so that is the end for tonight. The next time we read this book, we're going to see some more Persian action, but fought not by the Greeks, but by the Macedonian Alexander. 
We're going to read the very famous Battle of Issus and the equally famous Battle of Gokamela, which, if you know your history, Alexander the Great never lost a battle, so spoilers. <laughs> but anyway, we'll look at those two battles next time we read this book. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that you found this video relaxing and educational. And I hope that you have a very good, good, good night.